you feel that you're just in that mood and really, really into this <laughs> What, into the <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm making use of that sheet of paper. You we know that we can, that's good. Never waste the back. Yeah, it's exactly. a perfectly clear back. There's no point. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We were living in a little house on the prairie. We wouldn't even have it. Piece of paper. We'd be writing our names on that chalkboard. <laughs> Oh gosh, I, I can't even imagine. Yeah, uh, can't imagine. Nope. Mm -hmm. One little metal cup, it's all beat up. Mm -hmm. Oh, interestingly enough, you know, with this whole urban or this whole homesteading thing, there's a lot of people that have really embraced the whole rural legal I never read the books because I just it was like, oh. Really? Um, they're pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been around. <laughs> um, but, but they're really, but they're embracing that lifestyle. Sure. No. It's really interesting to see that. Yeah. Well, that. and it's sort of unique to them, probably, where, you know, we can work with people that were in the Depression and stuff. So not that big a deal. Yeah. 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 Like, I can together. It is not for me. <laughs> I have to have hot and cold running water with an emphasis on the hot. The potty has to wash. That's right. And an electric blanket. Yeah. 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 I, I can live without some other things, but we did camping a lot when my sons were younger. Uh, they're in their mid 20s now, but when they were younger and they were in Boy Scouts, and we did camping a lot, a lot of tent camping. And so when my husband said, you know, okay, well, let's let's move it up. Let's get us a little camper. Oh, gotta have a pot. I don't care hardly about anything else. Gotta have a pot. I need a pot. <laughs> So I have to have the shelf. Yes, yes, that's that's helpful. But if you're just going for a couple of days, it's not too bad, you know. I get creative. <laughs> I don't know why. And they have we've uh, we've been uh, camping uh, up in the Rocky Mountains where we took a, a tent. Well, it was a shower tent and put it up, you know, next uh, out and everything. And so that's where we took our showers out there as well. So that was cool. Yeah, so that was work. Yeah, that was really nice. And it, you know, you had that black bag and the water up and yeah, yeah and it heated it up. It was very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. So yeah. That's, some things that need to be civilized. Not like that's uptown. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well good night. Good evening everybody. Good night. So <laughs> you know, as you know, I do the Wyoming Bee College Conference and it's next weekend. And, and so the devil's in the details, right? So it's all starting to come together and things have changed. I went from being in this building to being back in the rack and, and the uh, health science building. So the Bee College just got moved. First it was on paper. And, and so it's, it, as it gets closer, I get a little wrapped tighter. And so I can't type anymore. I can't spell. I can't talk. Wow, some very strange equipment. So it's not here. It'll be it'll still be on L Triple C campus. Friday will be in this building. Saturday and Sunday will be in in the RAC, the Recreation and Athletic Center campus. So the big gym, the big gym. And then the classes will be in in the health center. Yeah, which is, I have 19 vendors. Yeah, we have a lot of vendors. Yeah, so. How many people are coming back? Right now, it's right around 115. Oh, wow. So it's it's actually a down a little bit for 2019. Yeah, so I feel like I'm starting over. Yeah, you know how that goes. So, are you ready? <laughs> so it's nice classes, obviously on pesticides, and there there are some other people within Extension that kind of specialize in this area. 
But what I don't want to teach you guys is how to calibrate sprayers, how to calibrate the amount of liquid that you need to go into the tank to spray. I don't want to teach you that. I don't want to teach you what insecticide to use to kill what bug. So this is going to be kind of a general overview of insecticides and what they do and, and some of the people problems with them. And, and so this is some of the esoterical information that you don't get <clears throat> unless you really dig deep. And then um, I, after I hopefully scare you away from spraying around with Bible 7 on your hip, um, I give you alternative methods. So I, I say that kind of jokingly, but I did a yard call a couple of years ago where the homeowner, uh, we walked his whole 10 acres, looked at every tree, and he had a hip holster with a bottle of seven in it. And he was like, when you see a bug that needs to be killed, let me know and I'll kill it. So we did this whole tour, and the whole time his hand is on this bottle. <laughs> so when we get back, I give him my pesticide lecture. Um, what did you say? Did you change his mind? Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Good for you. Yeah. It doesn't take much, <laughs> really. And you'll see why in the lecture. Okay. okay. So the definition of a pesticide, any chemical, natural or man-made, that is designed to kill another organism. That's the definition of a pesticide. So hundreds of thousands of pesticides in the natural environment, just naturally found in plants, soil, bugs. And biological warfare was invented and perfected in nature. It must be kept in mind that for every scary synthetic pesticide man has created, nature has created something worse. And according to Dr. Bruce Ames, every plant produces roughly a few dozen toxins, some of which at high enough dose to be toxic to humans. And I think this is really interesting. Cabbage produces at least 49 known pesticides. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I love coleslaw. <laughs> I love growing cabbage. But uh, I think it takes poundage, poundage to uh, cause your problems. So some history to understand, better understand pesticides and where they came from. So before World War II, pesticides were predominantly inorganic materials, you know, lead, copper, sulfur, arsenic, boron, mercury. Can't even begin imagining using mercury as an insecticide. Those botanical compounds, nicotine, erythrum, rhodamine. So nicotine's been used for a long, long time. And you could just take a, um, a cigarette or some chewing tobacco you put it on your plant and water it in, and you have a natural insecticide for fungus gnats. I mean, that's another way to get rid of them. But you either have to buy cigarettes or the chew, or you have to uh, steal a couple of someone. So, spelling a myth. The Swiss developed DDT. It was always kind of associated with America, but we did not develop it. That was developed by the uh, very neutral alleged Swiss. And it, it truly did change the world of, of insect control because of how effective it was. And so DDT spun off some other insecticides. One is Lindane, Dalibrin, Coridane, and 2,4-D. So out of these, the only one that's still around is 2,4-D, which is an insect, which is a herbicide. And so homeowners could buy all this stuff. The Coridane was commonly used to kill ants. You take it out and spray it, you know, sprinkle it on your ant hill, around the hill. And it's a white powder. And my mother was out doing it one day with some Coridane, not wearing any gloves, just with her bare hands, sprinkling it on there. And my brother was right behind her because he thought it was powdered sugar. And so he was walking right behind her, eating corded. I think my mother's hair turned gray instantly. She called the pesticide hot. And it didn't cause any known harm to my brother. 
He managed to grow up to be six foot. Apparently, <laughs> that's only good for ants. Mm -hmm. Pesky little brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a good thing. So, the US, the uh, USDA um, <coughs> NASS, which is the uh, Agricultural Statistic Service, has a ton of information. And one of them is on pesticide use and how farmers and homeowners are using it. So, if you, this was done in 2007, the latest one is 2012. So a little old, but still valid information. And so you can see, even though I think, I think the United States has a tendency to realize over how much we use. If you look at what is used worldwide compared to what we use, we are really not that bad. So however, um, herbicides outrace Insecticides, we're always trying to kill weeds, we will never get a handle on that one. And fungicides and fumigants. And then again, when you look at that this big bar, this is the world use here. And this is the United States. So again, this is the latest information from 2012. Hopefully someday they release 2017. Hopefully. So this is a, a statistic on use in the United States by type. So you see agriculture, you know, they're fighting weeds and not getting up a hand. But if you look at, and then this is homeowners right up here, and industrial commercial, so this is like the lawn care people. But when it comes to insecticide homeowners really hate insects. I mean, just it's like wow. You can see how much more of the insecticides they use than an agriculture. So it's it's pretty noticeable. So one of my goals, you know, having you know, I've been aware of this statistic, this statistic has been around for a while. It hasn't changed much from 2007 and I think 2002. But one of my goals is try to get to people to understand how these insecticides work and the people problems and environmental problems that they cause. And, and to get you off of that being more organic and take a holistic integrated pest management approach to insect problems. And then if you need some light reading <laughs> this is the EPA Reclamation and Management of Pesticide Poisonings. So that's the other side that, that no one really is aware of, of, of some of the people problems it causes. And they, they happily sent that book to me for free. <laughs> So within a bottle of take pick, insecticide, fungicide, herbicide, whatever, this would be the main ingredient, the active ingredient. <clears throat> and that's that's going to be the actual chemical. And it could be pretty low. When you look on the, the box of bottle for um, Roundup, the amount of glyphosate in there is like 1.97%. And the rather is other. And so the additive ingredient is usually pretty small compared to the alleged inert ingredient. Sometimes the main ingredient is going to require some mixing. Read the directions if it does. Malathion comes in a little bottle, and you have to read the 2.5 on the side and hope you mix it right because it's it's pretty toxic by itself. And sometimes if you You over apply thinking, I really want that bug dead. And so if a little is good, then a lot is better. Sometimes that a lot becomes ineffective and it doesn't work. So more is not better in, in the world of using insecticides. So most of these 
most of these chemicals uh, will have some sort of synergist to it. And that's when one compound enhances the effect of another. And sometimes many times beyond what would be experienced if it was by itself. So in the presence of a synergist, a little bit can go a very long ways. And one of those synergists is hyperonyl butoxide. And that's it's derived from sesame seeds, which you know, who knew? You know, I like sesame seeds and I cook and on my bread. And, but it's um it's a registered pesticide or insecticide rather, and it's predominantly used to enhance or be a synergist to arrhythmics. So if you look at if you look at the bottle and read the ingredients, which you which you're supposed to, because the label on insecticides and herbicides and all those. Is a, is a federal regulated label. And so the label is the law and it's a federal law that governs that label. And I don't know of any homeowners that have ever been taken to the task because they didn't read the label, but agricultural especially is held to an extremely high standard when it comes to insecticide use. <clears throat> Okay, hey, inert in, in earth ingredients. So I'm having a hard time talking. Um, I've always looked at inert ingredients as being sort of like, you know, the table's inert, right? Always inert. Well, not so within the chemical world. And by federal law, the active ingredients must be identified by name, but the inert ingredient does not have to be listed. And it's just listed as other. So the other, does not mean non-toxic. In fact, sometimes that other inert ingredient is actually very, very toxic. Contain more than one inert ingredient. And it, it aids in the effectiveness of that insecticide or herbicide. And sometimes it's in the form of, you know, preventing it from getting hard or caking up foaming, excessive foaming, a lot of anti-foaming agents are used that are inert ingredients. Sometimes it can extend the shelf life. And sometimes there are solvents, um, Roundup, the solvent in Roundup is pretty amazing. And, and that's what allows the herbicide to break through that waxy cuticle layer and actually get down into the leaf. So some inert ingredients. Xylenes can cause um, eye skin irritation, headaches, nausea, confusion, tremors, anxiety, methylparaben. So for all the school teachers in here, um, lice, sometimes lice becomes a problem with school kids. There's a few of you nodding your head going, oh yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, who knew, you know, you don't want your kid bringing home lice, right? But there are products for it, but but keep in mind that that inert ingredient, the methylparabine, um, it's regulated as a drug, causes skin sen sensitivity, digestive and respiratory irritation. And dimethyl ether found in flea products. So a lot of times you're, they don't put this in flea collars anymore. They, they backed off of that because there was too many dog, dog and cat problems. Uh, respiratory skin, eye irritation, depression, and central nervous system issues. Butane, who knew? They were putting butane as an inert ingredient. <clears throat> Found in high household insecticides, exposure causes irritation, nausea, and drowsiness, among other things. So this is the inert ingredient in Roundup. And this this took a lot of research and digging to find this. Because <laughs> they don't want you to know that it's polyethyl oxalated talomine. And it improves the solubility by increasing the penetration of the plant's waxy surface. So I, I list where I found it. I want to go dig that up. But it's extremely toxic, extremely toxic. And so Roundup has gotten a really bad rap. And you know, the, the guy in Cal, the um, custodial landscape maintenance guy in California with his 
um, cancer problem, which is, that's sad, but he was using Roundup without any protection. No gloves, he's wearing open toe sandals, shorts, mm -hmm. and so, and he was using it like daily with no protection. And so it wasn't the glyphosate that got him, it was the polyethyl oxalated halloween. That's what caused the problem. And it's very, very toxic. So, but they don't really tell you that on the box bottle. You know, they just tell you to glove up and wear personal protection, long sleeves, pants, shoes. And, and so this is what's caused the problems. Okay. There's a lot more inner ingredients out there, but I thought those were the more entertaining ones. So pesticides, and the word, and keep in mind, the word pesticide is a umbrella term. And underneath that word pesticide are all these other subclass types of, pe types of pesticides. So you have arachnicides, attractants. So you're trying to bring that insect in. Usually that's done on a sticky trap or some sort of uh, other trap to catch things. There's a lot of attractants out to catch the um, Japanese beetle. I mean, we're always looking for that guy here. Avicides, bactericides. So I put the bactericides in there because for a if you if you haven't noticed, they're starting to take the antibacterial or the antibacterial stuff out of soaps now because that was causing huge problems. That's part of the whole antibiotic resistant issue. And that we're <clears throat> using all these soaps that were going after bacteria, and those bacteria were getting resistant to it. So they've taken all that out now. Fungicides, herbicides, insecticides. The list is actually a, a much longer, but just understand that when you say pesticide, it's an umbrella term, and it doesn't really mean a lot until you get specific and say, I'm using an insecticide or I'm using an herbicide. Okay, so then they're also classified, yes? Yeah, I really got chewed out for writing that article and kind of publishing it. Yeah. Yeah, it was really interesting. I, I didn't know I was throwing a rock in the pond, but there were a lot of really upset people. It's like, oh no, that's not going to happen. And it's like, oh yes, it has. Try to control Palmer amaranth or bindweed or some of those other really kosher. Yeah. Yeah. So classified by function. So now that you know that there's this where pesticide is an umbrella term and all the different types of products that fall under pesticides, there's different ways that they work. So one is an attractant, and probably one of the best ways is you know, ants make people crazy. And you can buy little baits, little bait traps, go to the grocery store and get them or hardware store. You just set them down and it's and it's attractive. It either smells really good to them or appeals to them. And they take some of that bait and they take it down and they feed it to the queen and the queen dies. End of the ant problem. Repellents. So I guess the better the better repellents are like um, um, for mosquitoes and flies to keep them away from you, to keep them from biting on you. Desiccants. So the best desiccant out there is diatomaceous earth or DE. And diatomaceous earth is the skeletonized remains of diatoms. So when you look at it under a microscope to the insect, it's like crawling across a field of broken glass. And so it abrades the insect's body 
and they just leak out. You're going to feel like assassins by the end of the night. Um, 100 ways to kill a bug. They were the uh, diastomaceous, the diastomaceous syrup works really well on soft bodied insects, aphids. Doesn't work real well on slugs because slugs are too slimy and they just sort of put a slime across the DE and it doesn't seem to bother them. Um, I used to raise Angora goats and they always had a problem with lice, just kind of a goat thing. And so I would use DE on, on them and that worked for that, that particular pest. Wasn't that the, the gardeners like you call organic? Yes. And it can hurt you just as much as that. Though, right? Oh, you keep breathing it in. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. It's it's the silicone, and, and you breathe too much in of it, and it's going to harm your lungs. So you've got to be really, any of these that you, you just have to be very careful with. And mask the gloves, just because it's certified as organic doesn't mean that it's safe. So there is an organization out there. Called OMRI, O M R I, and this is the Organic Material Review Institute. And if you find a bag or box or bottle or whatever and it's got OMRI on it, that means it's okay to use for certified organic crop productions. And then it's, again, it's, it's not going to be the harsh chemical, but it still has to be handled with precaution. Because again, diet, like Francis was saying, that diatomaceous earth will put up a um, kind of a powder. You don't want to breathe that in. Absolutely not. So pass through. This is a this is another uh, one of my soapbox things when people want to use manure in their vegetable gardens. There's a, a product you can buy, and it comes in a tub, and it's a molasses-based tub, and it's called Raybon. And so you feed it to your horses or your cattle. And so they they eat this because it's very tasty. It's molasses, their favorite thing. And they eat it and it passes through, the Raybon passes through and it's in their manure. And so when a fly comes along and lays an egg on it, the egg catches into the larva, it kills the larva. So you just, if you've gotten, and a lot of times a horse owner will forget they even did that because that will last so much, right? So, you risk not knowing what is totally in that manure. So you could actually be putting an insecticide in your vegetable garden by not knowing where the source and, and everything that was fed to that animal. So I see those those ads and traders all the time. Great, come get it <laughs> in my corral. Yeah. Uh, so I think maybe that's feeding that because it's a, it's kind of a weird attempt to reduce the fly population. Yeah, and you know, anytime you're around horses or any livestock, you can have a fly problem. And so this is the Raybon is one way that they use to kind of do it. Systemics. Out of all the insecticides that I have to recommend as part of my job, I do like recommending the systemics. And Bayer makes one. They're now called. They now call themselves Bio Advanced. And you just mix it in water and you pull it around the base of the tree. And I recommend it for non-flowering trees and shrubs. And so the tree takes it up through the root system and spreads it out to all the leaves, and needles, or whatever. And then whatever is trying to eat it or bore into it, the systemic kills. So this way you're not spraying the tree or shrub and you're not putting insecticides into the environment. And you know, inevitably when a homeowner does it, it's there's a breeze or something, and it's really hard not to spray yourself. So I think this is a lot safer for the environment and the homeowner. Do you do that once a year or? So most of these systemics are once a year. You do it, the best time to do it is in the fall. It's watered in really well. And the best way to help that tree or shrub is to make sure you stay on a good watering schedule to keep help push that up. 
that product up. So we use that on our um, monthly cotton work on your And it took two days and there's no time at all. Yeah. 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 And, and the key to making work even better is to water, 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 water. Yep. Yeah. So like, you feel like like assassins in the class. Uh, maybe I should change the title. Uh, so they're again classified by functions. Again, um, growth regulators. So when an insect is given a growth regulator, and it it tells them. Tells them to stop growing in different ways. And sometimes, like on um, insects that shed their exoskeleton, it'll tell them not to shed that exoskeleton, but they can continue to grow. And so they, they keep growing in this like little suit of armor until they can't fit in anymore. And then they sort of crush themselves. So, so I'm gonna I'm teaching you guys how all these work and, and why they work and, and how so you understand what you're doing. Contact poisons. This is one where it actually has to touch the insect. And so it's like neem oil, which is, everyone comes says being organic, is a contact poison. So it has to touch the bug. And so the bug usually, the insect, most insects groom themselves. And so they'll groom that off and then they lick it and ingest it. Stomach poisons, um, since stomachs are pretty much stomach poisons. So they have to eat it, ingest it, and then it goes after their gut. And we um, pass this guy. This is also a bait. Thus, thus has got to be another contact poison. So this is no low bait. This is for going after grasshoppers. And, and so instead of using seven, you know, spraying something into the environment. This works really well. And a couple of years ago, we had just this biblical grasshopper position. It was, it was phenomenal. And so I put this out, and in 24 hours, I had knocked back 50% of the grasshoppers. So this is also a biological control. And so this is a protozoa that's been infused on, on, on barley. And so it's, it's harmless to people, to animals, and it only works on the target insect. You have to mail order it. Sorry. You might find it down in Colorado. So if a bird eats the dead grasshopper, they don't get poisoned? No. But if, a, if another grasshopper eats a grasshopper that's been killed by that, then that grasshopper is now eating that poison. And it will kill that grasshopper. The grasshopper will kill it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so chickens are also chickens and turkeys are some of the best grasshopper control I have ever ever had. And there's a organic plot up at the University of Wyoming research station up in Lingle, and they were having the same problem. And they got they got chickens, and overnight the grasshoppers were gone. So between chickens and the nolo bait, and that's one of the few where I will handle barehanded because it's it's specifically two grasshoppers. And I think if you read the, the box, the bag a little bit, you'll see the Omri designation on there too. Um, aerosols, that's, you know, raid in the can. Fumigants, that gets pretty crazy. Uh, I've talked with a gentleman a couple weekends ago that was convinced he had termites in his place. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe, maybe, you know, he probably had carpenter ants more than he had termites, but that's kind of where you have to fumigate the whole house. And that is a specialist. Okay, so then there's modes of action. So it's either going to be a contact poison where it's got to touch the insect. Stomach poison, the animal has to eat it. So like your ant trap baits where the ant picks up the bait, carries it back down to the, to the nest. 
or systemic poison where the plant takes it up and then the insect eats it and kills the insect. So that's the three mode, three main modes of action. And then in order for pesticides to be categorized by toxicity, it's done as the lethal dose. And so the lethal dose is kind of a theoretical number. And it's based on, so the LD50 is, is considered to be extremely, extremely lethal. Like, like a taste could kill a person. And so the 50, the 50 is the reference referred to the dose of a given substance that kills 50% of the organisms exposed to it in the sites. So it's expressed in milligrams of poison per kilogram of body weight. Well, insects don't, you don't weigh an insect by a kilogram. They're, they're micrograms, nanograms sometimes. So they, so the theoretical LD50 rating is based on a group of 150 pound men consuming approximately 6.8 milligrams of a pesticide Presumably, that half the individuals will die immediately. And that's where the LD50 came up from. So the LD50 is a benchmark number. And the bigger the number, the least toxic it is. And the smaller the number, the more toxic. So a big number is safer, a smaller number is pretty scary. There is an LD5 insecticide that's used in greenhouses. And, and that's one where the whole environmental suit is born. They go in, they spray it. The greenhouse is sealed up. You don't enter in for like 48, 72 hours. And it's usually because they're trying to kill spider mites or, or uh, white flies. So to give you an example of the LD50 number, laundry bleach. Bleach is extremely, very, it's very toxic. A taste to a teaspoon of bleach. I put in rubber cement because I think of the, you know, in high school, you know, the boys would put rubber cement on their hand and roll it up. Yeah, the teachers in here are going, yeah, and then they eat it. <laughs> yeah, only a little boy. Sorry. Not all little boys. So a teaspoon to a tablespoon is highly toxic. Liquid detergent, moderately toxic. And then I put baby lotion in there because no one in their right mind would drink baby lotion. So all of your insecticides, herbicides, they should have a warning label on them. And so they're going to have different categories. That category one warning label is going to be danger, highly hazardous poison, taste to a teaspoon. These are insecticides or herbicides that you are not, as a homeowner, are not going to be able to get. If you've taken a pesticide, App certifier certification class, and you're now certified as a pesticide applicator. You can buy this sort of stuff, but as a homeowner, you can't get a hold of this. And the next category is a warning teaspoon to a tablespoon. Category three and four is a caution. That's when you get that really high, have to just about drink it. And again, the label is the law, it's a federal law, so you have to read it. And this is a lot of times what it's going to look like on the label. Yeah, this is this is more what we're going to find in the stores. Okay, so from a client, so this goes back to reading the label. This client, this person did not read the label. I used Fertilone systemic drench for tree and shrubs last year on my fruit tree. This year, it has a large harvest of peaches. I'm concerned the fruit is not fit for consumption because it may contain a pesticide. I'm like, well, did you read the label? No. It would be a shame to let it go to waste, but I obviously don't want to eat toxic fruit. Did you read the label? No. Throw the fruit away. Because <laughs> the fruit, the one was not labeled for peaches. And so if it was labeled for apples, she 
could have eaten them, but it's not labeled for peaches. So she had to throw the once every 10 year peach crop away. Mm -hmm. Yep. Read, read the label. I know it's not fun reading. It's not what you're going to read at breakfast, but there you are. So for people, different modes of act, different ways that it enters our bodies. So our skin is highly absorbable. And so that one plant that was running around with this bottle of seven on his hip, it was picking up his hands. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been at a client's place and they've said, yeah, we just sprayed. And there's their iced tea sitting there or a beverage. And it's like, you know, there's a real good chance it's in that iced tea. And then of course, breathing it in. And a lot of people don't take that into consideration, breathing what that can cause. Not the wind's blowing it away. Are you upwind or downwind? And so to really kind of bring home the absorption rate of the human body, there's this really cool chart that I found. And I, I don't even remember where I found it. And it's a little on the old side. It's a 1988 data may have changed. But you know, your hands absorb a lot, even your scalp. So when you think about, you know, you're outside and you inevitably, you know, you, you want to rub your face or rub your ear or, or something. Try not to. Try to, you know, prevent, pre pretend that COVID is back and you can't touch your face with your hand, right? Who knew? <laughs> but if you look at this, you can see the different rates of absorption by the skin. And so I always tell the guys in the class, it's like, you know, wash your hands before you use the bathroom. Yeah, because I didn't, you know. Oh, yeah. Read, read the label. What do they call it? Uh, contact. Yeah. And oh, yeah. There's so within extension, we have an extension educator who teaches almost nothing anymore but pesticide um, safety and does the pesticide class every year. And he brings in the whole pesticide personal protection equipment and you know your tieback suit your your booties your blue gloves goggles so you really have to take some extraordinary precautions if you're going to use insecticides because none of them are really safe yeah oh and the other thing is she think about what you're wearing on your feet when you're walking through what you've already spread I see so many. So we had accidentally had a guy who was sprayed when we bought the house first before we had lost the house. He sprayed our pet toys that were out the yard. Mm -hmm. He sprayed the pet bowls. I mean, it was covered with stuff. We had to pull it all out. Mm -hmm. And of course, we told him we sealed it. He had to put it in the yard because he had an issue. But yeah, the dogs and the cats, people don't think about that. They're exposed. Yep. So I have I have a good story on that one, too. Did a, I did a yard call, and every year we have, we get the um, pear slugs. They're not true slugs, they're the larva of a sawfly. But they look like a little tiny slug. And they like nothing better than to get on Tony Asters and eat the area between the veins. And so they kind of skeletonize these. It's cosmetic. Don't worry about it. But a lot of homeowners get pretty excited when they see the leaf, finally see leaves skeletonized and want to immediately do something about it. Well, by the time you see a leaf that's been skeletonized, the insect is long gone. So this guy went out and he sprayed with one product. He came back, didn't see any, in his mind, relief from the skeletonization of the leaves. What he was seeing was just old damage. And he got another product and sprayed it again. Then he had me come out because he was still just baffled. And I said, well, the leaf isn't going to heal itself. Don't worry about it. It's, you know, cosmetic. I going to hold it. And then he started talking about his little dog. And he had a little Maltese. And 
and the dog was following us around, just happy little thing. And then he's, and of course, I'm, a, I'm an animal person, and so you must have to pick the little dog up. He's going, Yeah, I just spent a thousand dollars on this dog at the vet trying to figure out what was wrong with her, and she was having convulsions oh, and gosh. just went on with the whole litany of, of problems. And I said, Show me what you used. And so he went and showed me the two bottles and the little bottles. And so we had to um, do the math and dilute them and then spread. He had bought two bottles of the same thing, just different labels. So he never read the label. And he sprayed when his dog was out. And so he sprayed his dog inadvertently. And the dog had um, gotten neurotoxin toxicity. Spent $1,000, poor dog. Oh my God, poor dog. Yeah. Yeah. So people may already know this, but there's an experiment you can do to prove like how fast things absorb through your skin. You don't like think about it, but they do. If you take if you peel a of garlic and rub it on your the bottom of your foot, you'll taste garlic instantly. Like just yeah, and it I I tried it. It's the skin really does absorb stuff really fast. Yeah. Really, yeah. yeah. So this is the LV50 of some insecticides. Nicotine has an LV of 50 to 60. So nicotine is extremely toxic. It's, so for one time, you could buy a product called Black Flag. Mm -hmm. They took it off the market because it was so toxic that people were misusing it. And so I'm going to pick on homeowners because they don't read the label. You guys are all on Master Gardeners. You got to read the label, right? <laughs> you push yourself in a different category. Um, seven. So this is one that makes me crazy because people buy it, can buy it at Walmart, and you know if you can buy it at Walmart, it's got to be safe, right? Same thing with malathion. It's got to be safe. But look at what the LV level of it is. That's really still very toxic. And then when you get up to neem, which is Azadactrin, um, India, you know. 13,000. And really, I'm missing a zero, but you're going to leave it all back there. Um, but there's also a really neat, kind of an interesting book called Neem. And Neem has a huge amount of versatility, and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later in the lecture. So, some people problems. <laughs> So the book that I passed around, the EPA book, that was a result of the 99th U.S. Congress Neurotoxicity Identification and Controlling Poisons of the Nervous System study. And one of those is um, they've, they've associated, been able to link back Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease to toxic chemical exposure. And some of the biggest problems that they find are in Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, so you, your states that really use a lot of those chemicals. And there are also a lot of, and, and so I say pesticides, but really herbicides. Not a lot of research or study done on herbicides, but we do know that they are hormone mimics. And so when you don't where your gloves and you're using, you know, weed be gone or whatever, it's still a hormone mimic. And so you've got to be really careful in handling these. Um, okay. Big words. Um, they've also discovered that a lot of these hormone mimics also go after estrogen and testosterone. So they're not, they're not benign. The herbicides especially. So some symptoms, apprehension, twitching, tremors, confusion, and convulsions, fatigue, headache, dizziness, nausea, mild physical distress, muscle weakness, breathing difficulty. Um, this can be humans, it affects mammals also. So it, it's kind of like the summer flu, kind of like the same flu-like symptoms, although I don't know about the convulsions and tremors that you associate with food, but anyway. So again, under modes of action, they're further broken down into nerve poisons, muscle poisons, 
physical toxins and repellents. So there's synaptic poisons and they act by interrupting the normal synaptic transmission of the nervous system, causing the nerve to continue to fire, which in turn causes tremors and death. And then there's the axonomic poisons and they interrupt again, normal axonomic transmissions of the nervous systems. Erythroids, chlorinated hydrocarbons are responsible for those. And so they work. So I had someone help me build this PowerPoint and I've never been able to get rid of the animation. <laughs> I'm sorry. So these nerve poisons work by being anticholinesterase enzyme inhibitors. And those are your organophosphates and carbamates. And then you have your cholinomimics, nicotine and nicotine solvates. So most of these are neurotoxins. So when I say neurotoxins, I want you to start thinking of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's associated with that. So again, physical toxins block metabolic process via physical rather than chemical means. Oils are used against aquatic pests to prevent respiration. So again, we kind of suffocate them. And, and when you think about how an, an insect breathes, so we go back to Scott's class and they've got spiracles along their sides, the bodies. And so they breathe through those spiracles. And even your worms are, are skin breathers. So they breathe through their skin. And so when you put something like an oil on them, you're clogging that and causing suffocation. And the dormant oils, the same thing. If we use a lot of dormant oils or recommend dormant oils for scale on aspen trees. And, and all you need to do is just take like a vegetable, a cheap vegetable oil or an old vegetable oil that's in your cupboard that's gone rancid. And you just rub it over the scale and that acts as a suffocant and you kill your scale that way. You don't have to do anything special for those. What, what time of year do you do that? Oh, so for scale on aspen trees, um, normally we start watching it in, in March, but it takes a couple weeks of warm weather for them to emerge out from underneath the scale and start crawling. They go into the crawler stage. Depends upon the weather. So you really have to, again, be the weather watcher. And when it starts getting warm out, and, and you can do an application of dormant oil on the scale. And you know, if it rains or snows, you have to add another layer on there, but you can keep doing that. Tell a great story about that. After I was advised that I've actually been here 20 years, not 19, and I'm thinking I missed a year someplace. Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, a lady bring me in. I, I couldn't get out into the field that day, and it was like, can you just bring me a sample so I can see what you're talking about? And so she did. But she put it in her purse and she had started off on on sunday with this sample in her purse and by thursday finally made it to me well in the meantime the, you know the purse is kept warm right well there's a a little twig in there that's got oyster shell scale on it well the oyster shell scale emerged and they were now in the crawler stage and i had never seen that before when they were in the crawler stage and so i got the little hand lens out and she had her two kids there and I'm showing her, showing her kids and they're looking at it and they're going, oh, wow, look, mom, look, they're crawling. Yeah, that was pretty. Sometimes it's, it's never dull, let's just say it's never dull. Uh, repellents, okay, they don't kill the insects or, or animal. A lot of times there's repellents out there for skunks and raccoons and deer. And oh my gosh, there's just all sorts of different ways to repel. Um, I, people tell me anecdotally that Irish spring soap repels deer really well. And if you if you've ever smelled Irish spring soap, I mean, that's that repels me. <laughs> but if you 
put it in a little a little mesh bag or nylon and hang it up around your garden. It every what people tell me is it does repel deer. Yeah. So repellents are very low to no toxicity. So the number is really big. And there's some new products out there. There's a Warren that's going to replace, is trying to replace DEETS. DEETS still very effective, developed by scientists at the USDA, and by the US Army in 46, registered for use by the general public in 57, a broad spectrum repellent effective against mosquitoes, biting flies, chiggers, fleas, and ticks. So very effective, very useful. And Remarkable safety record on it, just remarkable. The, the problem occurs when it's misused. And I was at I was at I was at the farmer's market, to the Tuesday farmer's market, and a mom walked by with her little kid, and she had a bottle of that um, of this stuff, the sanitizer, the hand sanitizer. And she was literally cleaning her kid with this stuff. And, and she was rubbing it on his face and his arms. I mean, he was germ free, <laughs> totally. Poor kid, I mean, you could just, I mean, he was like cringing, unhappy kid. So misuse, misuse is the biggest problem on it. And we label, little goes a long ways. Yeah. So you can buy like earth now that are impregnated with some kind of repellent. Do you know what that is? I have, I have too. I, 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 I bought some stuff to buy a shirt and wore it in Alaska. And we didn't, you know, there were no mosquitoes on us. So yeah, it's, I really like the mosquitoes. So that's yeah, I know. Yeah, we just bring our shirts. And they have to dry for a while and you shouldn't wash them like over and over. Yeah. I, I know uh, I've got a master gardener that's traveled a lot in the military and she talks about all her clothes having been sprayed and before she travels and you know, I don't know. I don't know what it is that they use and it's, if it's I don't know what it was and I'm just glad it's not sprayed on me. There's, there's some out there that are pretty, they're getting a lot better. The thick Warren is relatively new. And it's supposed to replace DEET as far as safety. And it's available to use. I first found it to use on my dogs. I have two white dogs, and flies just love white. And so they're always plagued with it. And so this stuff I spray on them. What is that? It's a pick warm. Yeah. I'll try, I was, I'll try to remember to bring the bottle. Uh, <laughs> so, so there's some stuff out there, but and then and then there's a lot of homemade remedies too. You know, um, catnip is real is a real good repellent insect repellent. Okay, two main chemical groups: inorganic and carbon based. So the inorganic pesticides are going to be more stable, water soluble. So there's boric acids, borates, chlorates, copper sulfates, silica aerogen, aerogel. Um, so the silica aerogel, you know, those little tabs you find in your vitamins or in, in some products, that's silica, silica aerogel. Um, boric acid, um, borates, 20 mule team borax, 20 mule team borax. Um, that's really good for repelling or getting rid of ants, stupid ant one. Um, sodium hypochlorite. Bleach. I can't tell you how many times people have called me and said, I took a bottle of bleach and I poured it all over the ant hill, but they're still coming out. Yeah, a hundred ways to kill a bug. <laughs> Worms the pass by oxidizing the tissue. A bad way to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, boiling water is another one I get. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, carbon based are compounds which sometimes contain hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, or sulfur, which is the majority of our modern pesticides. 
So under those carbon-based pesticides, these are the ones that are be pretty, pretty wicked. So under your organophosphates, eumelophion, methylparathion, diazinon, diazinon is now off the market. And diazinon was in weed and feed and insect killer lawn formulas. And it was meant to go after grubs in your lawn. And they took it off the market been off for quite a number of years now, but what they were finding is that the birds would eat that poison grub and then it was killing the birds. Seven, again, all of these are neurotoxins. So they all go back to interfering with the cholinesterase enzyme. And, and, it, and when you interfere with that enzyme, you cause the nerve to fire rapidly. So it's like the insect just drank a whole pot of espresso. So he's just going to shake himself to death. Chlorinated hydrocarbons. Those are your DDT, chlorine, eldrin, dieldrin. They still make DDT. And DDT is shipped down to South America. So it's still made, still shipped, still made in the United States. Um, it used to be made in Marion, Ohio. I'm not sure if it's still there or not. Long, long life in the soil. All of these huge, huge half lives. I don't think they've ever really figured out the true half life of DDT because they still find it and they still find it pretty active in the soils. And so it has other repercussions up the food chain, including us still. So DDT was blamed for causing a calcium interference in eggshells, right? And so it's causing problems with birds. Well, what they never told you is it also causes calcium problems in humans. And so people who have osteoporosis and way back when they were trying to kill, control the um, Dutch elm beetle that was going after our American elms, the Dutch, the American elms were constantly sprayed with DDT. And so there was a lot of people problems, especially with osteoporosis being just really, really bad. Okay, again, organophosphates, diazinon, malathion, or orthine. You can still buy malathion and orthine. Again, it's a, it's a nerve toxin and it inactivates that clonesterase enzyme so, so again, it's, it has some, some pretty interesting repercussions people-wise and pet-wise too, and small mammals. When the height of the mountain pine beetle epidemic, that was, I hope we never go through that again. Uh, I had a guy call me and he was in tears. He was in tears. He had just sprayed a tree from a pine beetle and he had picked up a squirrel that had fallen out of the tree and he's going, I don't know what to do with this for this squirrel. It's convulsing. And then it died in his hands. And he was in tears. He just hung up on me. He couldn't, he couldn't take it. So a lot of problems with these, not just with our bugs, but with people and our mammals. So organophosphates, which is malathion. And the 75% of malathion to break down, it takes a whole year. Um, so all these organophosphates are highly acutely toxic to bees, wildlife, and humans. <clears throat> and yet you can readily go out to Walmart and buy malathion. And, and people think that it's safe because it's at Walmart. There was an article, it might have been in the Sierra Club magazine, or one of those that I get, that talked about you know, on Amazon. Apparently, you can get much more toxic chemicals, and people are going to Amazon to get stuff that they shouldn't be touching. Right. And storing it in garages and in basements, and it's causing a lot of problems with exposure. Right. And everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. When the house that, that we bought out in Carpenter, the previous owners were also sheep, raised sheep, and they had sheep dip down in the basement. 
they're just stored in the basement. And so that's an insecticide to go after cats and sheep ticks. And it's, it's like, you gotta be kidding. So it took me quite a while to get that aired out and chemicals going on. But man, really, you don't want to live with these chemicals. And but my my parents were the same way. I'm sure a lot of a lot of them here. My dad had still had Lindane cordane. And when we cleaned out his garage, I had this box of these chemicals and I took them to um, the sanitation part to get rid of them. My mom used to uh, dust the inside perimeter of the house with seven dust. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah. 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 I remember just seeing it mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't where you couldn't see it. It was, you know, it was very evident. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I know. Well, it's scary. Yep. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So the EPA now um, has a little B on the label. And so if the, if the chemical is, is not toxic to a B, it'll be like, okay. But if there's a circle and an X through it, it means it's really toxic to bees and they'll kill your bees. So there's some symbols on there. And again, you kind of need those. Things. I know the label is kind of ponderous to read and it's a tiny font. And it goes on and on and on and on. <laughs> so I just gotta read it. Um, yeah, diazinon. Taken off the market. Highly toxic to birds, toxic to aquatic species. It wasn't persistent in the environment, so that was the good news on that. Carbamate 7. Again, this is a, a neurotoxin that inactivates you know, inactivates the chlorine acetate enzyme. So again, <clears throat> and, and you know, so the guy that I did the yard call and he was carrying that bottle of seven around with him. We finally got back to the house and he took the bottle down and he set it down and then he picked up his iced tea. And, drink. And, and so I started to explain to him what that seven does and how it works. And I, he just turned pale. And, and he did go in and wash his hands. So it was, I, I, did, uh, I did convince him not to use that. So chloral nicotine oil, canals. <laughs> Just not my better day. Modeled after natural nicotine. And so one of those is the imidacloprid or the neonicotinoids. And so this has really gotten a bad rap, especially within agriculture, because a lot of times they'll coat the seed with these neonicotinoids or imidacloprid. And part of it is just so that if there's a maggot or a Whatever in the soil that wants to eat that seed, it tries and it dies. The problem is a lot of times that when that seed germinates, it pulls that, that neonicotinoid up with it and becomes systemic. And it still goes up into the nectar. And so that's where it's starting to cause the problems. So that's why it's really got kind of a bad rap. But again, this is a product that I really like for homeowners as a systemic because you just mix it with water and you pour it on the soil at the base of the plants. The tree takes it up. And so you're not spraying it into the environment. You're not, you're not trying to do this and reach the top of the tree. You're just keeping it right at the ground. This is, um, the imidacloprid is also the main active ingredient in dog and cat flea and tick collars. Mm -hmm. Because the LD is so high on it, and the number is just huge. So it's very low toxicity to it. Yeah, so it kills in a, in a variety of ways contact, stomach. So it's, um, but it's, uh, it has a very low impact on, on warm blooded animals, on mammals. And so that's what makes it safe or safe-ish, not close. Well, you don't want to use it on your flowering plants. I do see it formulated once in a while for roses. And so the deal with roses is if you fertilize them and they grow a lot, and especially with the commercial fertilizers for roses, it causes a real fast growth. And that fast growth again is, is sweet, it's succulents, 
you know, that aphid can really tap into that root easily because there's less resistance, not a woody stem anymore, it's, it's soft. And so the more you fertilize a rose or your columbines or your lupins, the more aphids you are inviting to dinner. And so there's a lot of fertilizers that are a fertilizer and an insecticide, which is really very counterintuitive because it's because that plant will outgrow the insecticide and then you end up with insects again, but now you have insects that are going to become resistant. And so you use the product again, knocks back some of the insects, the plant grows like crazy, you got more insects. So it's just this, this treadmill, this chemical treadmill you get your plants onto. And so again, go back, make your own fertilizer, your master gardeners, make your own fertilizer, and, and just ignore that stuff. The, especially the marketing. Oh my gosh. You know, they either make you feel like you're not being a good plant parent if you don't use this product, or you're going to have the prize winning growers in the whole neighborhood. So kind of ignore the marketing. Okay. Hey, pyrithrums, pyrithrin, pyrithroid, pyrithromethrin. So these are all related. So the rep rum and its derivatives refer to the dried powdered flower heads of the plant erythrum rosium and chrysanthemum oxinium. You can actually make your own insecticide by growing these plants. <laughs> and, and, and again, if you're being careful with how you fertilize and grow your plants, you really aren't going to have this problem. And, and the object really in integrated pest management is to have a balance going on so that you've got good insects that are out there eating bad insects. And there really is a balance within the insect world where this takes place. One of the most important insecticides ever developed persists only for a few hours, which is really good. But again, uh, disruption of normal transmission of nerve. So again, it's a neurotoxin causing virtually instant paralysis in insects. So every once in a while I get someone that's like, I, I just want to kill this bug as quickly and as humanely as possible. And they step on it. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and, and so for some people, that's actually really important that they, they kill humanely. So this is one instant knockdown instant paralysis. And however, some insects can detoxify erythrin and recover from the initial knockdown. So that's why they put a synergist in by erythrin, and it's usually the piperonal detoxide, and so that they can't recover and walk off. So the piperonal detoxide steps in. Pyrethroids, synthetic, resemble pyrethrins, more toxic, and they last 10 days in the environment compared to a few hours that the natural botanic ones do. So, so they're always, so with insecticides, there's always that residual that how long are they persistent in the environment? And, and a lot of people don't think about that persistence. From methrin. So a synthetic pyrethroid, first marketed in 1973, so it's been around for a very long time. Cotton and corn are some of the heaviest users of any insecticide out there. They're always trying to, there's always something to try to eat corn or cotton, so they're always trying to spray it. But this is also readily available for home use. Persist up to three days, so not real bad. Doesn't have a long life in the environment. And with Rin, again, there's there's all these different variations on a theme. Toxic to honeybees and other beneficial insects. So a lot of times, our bad bugs are much more hardy and resistant to insecticides. And for whatever reason, good bugs have a tendency to just die instantly and not ever develop a resistance to insecticides. Okay, 
And then of course the insects that you really don't want to develop resistance, cockroaches, head lice, tobacco bug worms. <laughs> yeah, oh gosh, yeah. So for any of the teachers in here who've ever had to deal with students with head lice, yeah, that's a that's a nightmare. So what if there is a couple places to call for poison? You know, my dog, cat, little kid, I sprayed myself. So there's places to call, Rocky Mountain Poison Center, the National Pesticide Information Center, they can all help you. Yeah, so, so part of the problem is that most of our medical people aren't trained with the, uh, to recognize or understand pesticide poisoning. And, they, and usually it's not recognized until it's too late. And, and there's ways to counter some of this, but if you don't catch it soon enough. Um, a friend of my husband's crop duster for <clears throat> years, 40 years, and he is now in a, he's 60, he's now in a nursing home with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. So that's what crop dusting did to him. And it should have been caught years and years earlier. He should have been more careful. Okay. So now that you've taken a break, let's take let's take a break. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Take a break. That's an interesting question. How about those pe those shell pest strips? What we're doing? That's a that's a hybrid room. Are you skipping it up? Do you think it's the weather? Is it coming? <laughs> Yeah. Can you tell? <laughs> well, we oh, know. Yeah. 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 What brand is it? Mustang. Well, is there another? Mustang. <laughs> um, were you guys here when it was really cold? Yeah. Yes. Did you want a rosemary? I brought a rosemary and honey. We talked about it. So I brought a bunch of rosemary. Does anybody want any? Pizza. <laughs> Find some. Yeah. Here's a bunch. Yeah. Well, it's a girl. So what's that? Or you have it for dinner tomorrow. <laughs> Did you want to see what's on the screen? Or no? I would know. Even after this class, I would know how to propagate. I just. I just leave it in water until it roots, ah. and then I put it in dirt. You'll have uh -oh. like a I'm very high tech with nothing to propagate. This is scary. I wouldn't like that at all. Well, one of my favorite recipes, I do use rosemary. I know, but that's why I, I just have to teach my husband how to trim the rosemary. He just goes for the whole thing. I'm like, no. Just a little. A little bit. You know, the good news is it's a crab up tree. And so, you know, it's going to get a little bit bigger, but.
So we'll get back here. So it actually isn't a real long lecture, so it's kind of a little bit early. 
So hopefully you don't go home and have nightmares about this stuff. I may have bugger nightmares. Yeah. So the good news or not is all test sites break down eventually into hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Sometimes it takes a long time, sometimes it's really short lived. But a lot of what determines that is the conditions in which they're in. So the temperature, you know, is it cold out? Is it hot out? Is it humid? Is Wyoming, you know, humidity is a scarce commodity. <laughs> um, sunlight, you know, we, we get a lot of that great sunlight. That'll break things down very quickly. You know, the air, the location. So there's a lot of factors in how fast it breaks down or doesn't break down. So resurgence is when the predators or parasitoids <clears throat> of that particular insect that would naturally control that pest are temporarily removed or drastically removed in numbers. So the natural enemies of that insect are diminished in numbers or eliminated. And so that's where you get that resurgence. And so a lot of times when you use an insecticide, you end up killing the good guys along with the bad guys. But the bad guys can come back. They can withstand a lot of that. And so they develop a resistance. But the good insects don't, like your ladybugs and your damselflies and your green lacewings. They don't, they don't really develop that ability. And so they'll be re reduced in numbers or eliminated altogether. And then a lot of times the problem will worsen. And so what was just a few all of a sudden becomes hundreds of problem insects. And this is this is not an unusual problem, especially in any commercial greenhouses. Aphids, spider mites, thrips, white flies, these are all notorious insects that have this ability to have an insecticide resistance especially your spider mites. And when people call and say, well, what can I spray on a spider mite? It's like, so I'm get some neem oil or some soapy water and spray them with that. So insects, one of the most adaptive organisms on the face of earth. Take a look at cockroaches. <laughs> and they're Jurassic, they've been here forever. They have survived 40 million, 400 million years by adjusting. There are over 500 pest species that exhibit some level of resistance to at least one type of insecticide. So there's actually a lot more good bugs than there are bad bugs, but we've managed to make the bad bugs even worse. So then there's this thing called biomagnification, and this is one reason why diazinon was pulled off the market. But there was a, a pretty good study and research done in Florida with the with the brown pelican, and then also with the osprey. And so you use a little insecticide and it gets washed into the water. You don't think a lot about it. The, the, little, the little creatures eat, eat, ingest the insecticide, not a problem. But then you got another fish that comes around and eats that. So what started off as 0 0.04 parts per million, and now another fish comes along and he eats a lot of that. And all of a sudden now, now that fish has got 0.23 parts per million. So that little bit that, you know, the government goes, well, 0.04 is, is an acceptable number. Well, it accumulates. If you eat a lot of that acceptable number, it doesn't stay 0.04. And in that fish, it became 0.23 parts per million. Well, another bigger fish came around and ate the little fish. And pretty soon that secondary customer, that, that bigger fish now had point they had 2.07 parts per million. So now it's really getting a concentration of insecticides into its system. And then of course, the osprey came around or the brown pelican came around and then started to eat those fish that had a lot of insecticides in them. And so it was killing the osprey and the, the brown pelican. <clears throat> so they've since enacted some rules and have kind of turned that around. That's what biomagnification is. Just because 0.04 is okay, doesn't mean that it's 
okay all the time. Um, so when to spray, if you have to spray. So the, the, the big key again is, is you need to go back and identify the plant. What, what is that plant and what is the insect? Does that insect actually belong on the plant or not? So peonies, every spring, when that peony bud is there and it's covered in ants, I get, what do I spray it with? Well, nothing. Leave it alone. It's a, it's a symbiotic relationship that the peony has developed with ants. And the peony actually wants the ants on its bud to protect it from other insects like aphids. So it's a natural protection that that peony bud has developed. So, so it helps, so it helps to know why that insect is there in the first place. And you always want to start off with the least toxic method. And so the least toxic is shake it off, um, hose the plant down with water. You make your own safer soap, make a soap um, solution with like a, a tablespoon of liquid detergent and a gallon of water and spray it. You, you don't want to make it any stronger because you can turn that dish soap solution into a, an herbicide pretty quickly. You only want to spot spray and you don't want to repeat spray. Spray it once, let the chemical do its job. Water the plant, give the plant a big drink of water and do not fertilize it. So make your own fertilizer. You guys are master gardeners and then make your own fertilizer. And then only spray if there's an indication of insects that need to be sprayed. So one of the things that makes me crazy is these lawn care companies who've decided to add trees to their repertoire. And they go up to the owner and say, your tree needs to be sprayed. And if you don't spray your tree, the insects are gonna hurt your tree. And, and I mean, they do use some pretty strong arm tactics and they can, they can scare people pretty easily by saying these insects are gonna take out your tree. And so I'll get someone that calls me and, and says, well, yeah, I had my tree sprayed. Well, what did you have them sprayed for? Well, I don't know. Do you know what you had to spray with? Well, no, I don't know. And, and, and so they're pretty cagey about telling you what they're spraying for or what they're using. So you gotta be really, really careful with that. And don't let the, the lawn care company spray your trees for no apparent reason. Very few insects. Yeah. Extension office. Maybe send out like a it's it's probably not going to be on the website. You just have to call the extension office, the university extension office, and every county has an extension office. And so you just call and say, Hey, what are you hearing about? Or can you send me to someone that can talk to me about it? And then they're going to give the extension office will give you unbiased information that's research-based. Because we're, we're not here to make any money. We're not selling the product. We're not, not trying to get a job. Uh, we're trying, but we're, um, we're unbiased source. Or if you call a lawn care or tree company, you know, that's how they make their money. Come out and I know, talk with the guy just recently, I think it was at the Farmer Ranch Expo, or I don't know, it's all blurry. Um, but he, he had spent thousands of dollars getting his tree sprayed just last year for mountain pine beetle. And it's like, it's not an issue anymore. Don't spray. And, and so there, there is a lot of misinformation out there, and it's really upon the homeowner to do their research. But it's hard. I mean, where do you start? Because the internet is, is, a, is a swamp. Yeah. 
So what to protect if you do have to spray or protect the soil, because again, that can be pretty persistent in the soil. And out here, it gets in the soil and it can blow to your neighbors. It can, it can blow around, it can blow in your house. So protect the soil, you wanna protect the water because a lot of this stuff is very toxic to aquatic life. You wanna protect the air that you breathe. Plants, if you overspray them, you can end up with phytotoxicity, which is where the leaves turn like this color with black. Phytotoxicity. And you're not going to turn that one around. You want to protect your good bugs. And there's more good bugs out there than there are bad bugs. It's like for every thousand good bugs, there's one bad bug. So there's more good guys out there than bad. And of course, you want to protect yourself too, because you know some of these palms are not reversible, and so you want to be very careful. So, kind of a hot topic, controversial topic. So, the biotech crops, which are kind of unaffectionately referred to as GMOs. Um, have had a remarkable reduction in insecticide use. And when you think about, there's some wells out in Kansas that you can't take the water from because they're so polluted with insecticides. And even here in Wyoming, up in Torrington and Wheatland, there's so much fertilizer in the water and so much nitrates and nitrites that you don't even really need the fertilizer long. It's so high. So there's a lot of people problems by drinking, drinking that. So you want to be careful with it. So the amount of insecticides used because of, of crops that are resistant to corn earworm and the bowl, the bowl weevil that goes after the cotton bowls. <laughs> has been remarkable. It has taken out millions of pounds of insecticides out of the environment. So that's the good news on it because we know how bad these insecticides work on people. And you can see from 1980 to 2006, the drop in insecticide use. So if you do have mom and dad's or grandpa's old insecticides in the garage. This is who you call and you will set up an appointment with them. You'll give them an inventory of what you've got and then they'll take it and they'll dispose of it. And the last I heard, they still don't charge for it. They want to get it out of people's garages. Every Saturday they'll take it. Oh, time for a break. So I was a little ahead of myself. <laughs> That's my dog sitting on my cat. <laughs> and you can see how happy the cat looks. <laughs> the dog is very happy. The dog is going, the chair is warm and lumpy. <laughs> yes, I'm going to rip the dog's face off. Okay. <clears throat> so there are better ways. And for a number of years, for quite a long time, I had my property, my crops um, certified organic through the National Organic Program and through the Organic <coughs> Crop Improvement Association. So it's, uh, there's better ways to do it, a lot of better ways. Again, I've talked a lot about IPM integrated pest management, and as we always reach for the least toxic first, Identify the plant, identify the insect, identify the problem, and then ask yourself, why, why is this happening? Why does this plant have insects on it? Why does this plant look the way it does? And, and sometimes it will go back to management, how it was managed. Beneficial insects, water, biopesticides, you know, it's like the NOLO baits, a biopesticide. I think that's pretty cool. It was e it's easy to apply. You just take it out, throw it out there, grasshoppers eat it. Uh, easy, easy. Something else eats it, it's not going to hurt them. 
Um, Non-target animals, insects are not not impacted by this, and so so that's really the important thing. You're just going after the one bug or problem or weed that's causing the problem. So some bio insecticides, Bacillus thuringiensis. There's Israeliensis and Crustaci. So there's there's a whole bunch of different ones that you can die, and it just depends upon what you're going after. Some of them go after caterpillars, some of them go after white flies, mosquitoes. And so, and it's all readily available and you can get it on Amazon. Um, Avermectins, spinosad. Spinosad is derived from a lily, and it's one of those that you use it once, maybe twice. And, and that's all you use it because it's very effective, but it's it's an all natural, but it's still. So kind of interesting to use. As a dactrin, I said neem, the book has been kind of floating around. Um, Bulberia bassiana, um, mycoinsecticide. insecticide. So again, that's something that the insect eats and it causes that particular insect problems. Um, <laughs> so this is fun. From a plant's point of view, many insects are nothing more than dangerous, leaf-eating parasites that should die. <laughs> so plants produce insecticides like caffeine and nicotine to keep those obnoxious six-legged vegetarians away. They also produce pesticides that keep furry four-legged vegetarians away too. This is um, by Alex um, Rizal. And 99.99% pesticides, .99 pesticides we eat are produced by plants themselves. It's a fun book. <laughs> From a geeky horticulture perspective, um, plant derived pesticides or plant derived essential oils. Uh, again, I have a couple, my, a couple of master gardeners who are doing steam distillation. They're usually going after lavender and geranium. It's for those other ones to get the essential oils. But those into themselves can act as insect growth regulators. <clears throat> Um, anti-feeding, anti-molting, -mol respiration inhibitors, growth and cuticle disruptors. So a lot of your plant, your essential oils, the tonicals, they can act as insecticides too. So, so interestingly enough, on the flip side of that, there's a lot of the tonicals and essential oils that beekeepers use to help their bees. Lemongrass, chamomile, those are a couple of the ones that they use. Lemongrass. Be careful with lemongrass because it's a bee attractant. Mm -hmm. And so when you see people wearing bee beards, you know, they've got honeybees on their face. Mm -hmm. They've taken lemongrass oil and put it on their face. Mm -hmm. And the bees just love it. And so the bees just sit there. They don't sting the person, but they just hang out on that. They love that lemongrass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, the, the scalp bee should find that plant regardless, but it's it's specifically the honeybees. And so a lot of beekeepers in the spring, like May and June, will build swarm traps mm -hmm. and they'll put like a little cotton ball of lemongrass oil inside there so that a swarm goes into their bee box, into their swarm trap. Well, that's like three bees, three beehive. You know, someone else's bees have left. <laughs> okay. So again, we're talking about the botanicals and they're formulated as sprays, typically non-toxic. But they've got to be consumed. So now we're talking like the BTI, where it's got to be consumed by the insect. Um, some funguses can do this, non persistent, very short lived in the environment, a couple hours. LP spore disease is one of those. That's the predominant one used for Japanese beetle. But that's been around for a long time, developed in 48. Bacillus thuringiensis crustacei for worms found on trees and vegetables. So if you've got those like tent caterpillars in your trees, the BT 
Dr. Stackey is a good one to reach for. Then you can you probably go down to Fort Collins to find it, mail order it, get it. Uh, Israeliensis for mosquito control, black flies, fungus gnats, midges. So we, we kind of talked a little bit about that one before. Um, then there's a BT San Diego, and that's for the larva of the Colorado potato beetle and the elm leaf beetle. So for those of us who are vegetable gardeners, the Colorado potato beetle just will make you crazy because it'll defoliate a plant very, very quickly. And so this is an organic way to go after them. So different ways to buy this stuff, um, Bulgaria, Bassiana, um, Osima, Wokestii, which is that bag over there. Then you have to um, mail order it. And then the gypsy moth, we don't have a lot of gypsy moth problems. That, that kind of peaked out in the 90s. That was a problem up in the mountains. And then we have tussock moth problems for a while. That took out quite a few of our trees. But, um, but there is a, a, a virus that goes after them that you can use. It's just as specific to that mm -hmm. insect. Can I get to the yeah. Um, so that so miller moths are are a grub that lives in undisturbed prairie or grass. So lawns in a prairie are where you're going to find them, right? And and so trying to control them is almost impossible. And and you just hope that you've got enough birds in the area to take them out and eat them. <laughs> yeah. Did you did you the <laughs> yep. 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 So a couple of years ago, they were doing like a flu that year for our website. Isn't that like the beer though? That you can put the beer in the garden and put the melon into the beer? Those are slugs. Oh, the slugs. Slugs. Okay. Yeah, so the, the melon moth migrates the cooler environment. They don't like it hot, so they'll migrate up to the mountains. And when it gets too cold up in the mountains, they turn around and come back down to the, the prairie or your lawn. And it's in the fall that they lay their eggs in your lawn. So I won't And they were all over the house, right in the house a lot. A couple of years ago, yeah. I had to cover all my coffee cups and there are sit one in there. Yeah, so <laughs> if you have a choice, if you want to add books to your library, this is a really good one. This is Brittany Cranshaw, the professor at CSU. He's written a couple of really good books. And his, his recommendation of Miller Moth Control. Just a shop vac. <laughs> and so when they get into your house, just take the shop vac and suck them up with a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and and I had uh, another master gardener up in Torrington who that was his favorite tool for insect control was a shop vac. <laughs> and so he'd be out there vacuuming his plants and vacuuming around them. <laughs> yeah. You can't spend the light with your bucket of sugar water. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing I tell people to do is turn your porch light off. Mm -hmm. Turn your porch light off. <clears throat> and in that way, you know, your front porch light or your back porch light, turn it off so that they go to your neighbor's porch light instead. time on Kauai, they had just wild, free-ranging chickens. And then they got rid of all the chickens. I wonder if that kind of had a backlash problem. Yeah, different 
And they've actually discovered on those insect zappers that it actually attracts more good bugs than it does bad bugs. Mm -hmm. Yep. So just turn your porch light off and, and let them go to your neighbor's house instead. <laughs> so ants, I get a lot of calls on ants. And if there's a little white sugar ants, you just take that a little packet of ink bowl, which is the sugar substitute, aspartame. Sprinkle it down you know, on the ant hill or where they're traveling. They will pick it up and take it back to the queen. And so ant control is you've got to kill the queen or the queens because there's usually multiple queens in the nest. But for the little, little tiny ground ants, that aspartame works really well, works overnight. I, that's why I get it in my high tunnel and my vegetable garden. I just use that. Mm -hmm. So another fun book. Common Sense Pest Control. This is the whole book is on e ICAM, Integrated Pest Management. That's some really good advice in there. So, killing off the top, the ants that you see doesn't work because the queen goes, oh, ants 5,000 to 5,500 haven't returned, so therefore I must make more ants. And so you actually end up with a bigger problem you just kill off the, the surface ants. Um, cinnamon in high concentration is a type of a formaldehyde, and that will kill them. So you can make a mixture. You could mix some aspartame and cinnamon and flour. And I mean, if you really feel diabolical that day and, and <laughs> kill them off. But uh, yeah, and so this is from the EPA. <laughs> I thought that was interesting to find Jeff that there was that. Kaolin clay. So kaolin clay is used for a number of things. When you can, if you, um, sometimes you can take it for indigestion or if you've eaten something you shouldn't and you're kind of like, oh, well, you can take kaolin clay because that's like Pepto-Bismol. Kaolin clay is in a lot of toothpaste products and so it's it's just naturally there, but you can take kale and clay, dilute it out, and you can buy it, you can buy this at the health food stores. Dilute it out and spray it on your apples or your pears or your cherries, and it acts as a barrier. It helps prevent sunburn, but any little insect like thrips or worms that are trying to get into that apple, especially thrips because they leave a lot of little hooker type damage, and cosmetic damage, but. Um, you can spray the kale and clay on there, and it's it literally when the insect bites onto the kale and clay, it literally breaks their jaw. This is used a lot in the organic orchards. This one. And the, the non-organic, the, the traditional or conventional orchard are now using it too because it's cheaper. <clears throat> so it will control leaf, leaf rollers. Those are the little insects that, you know, you walk out and you see the leaves on your tree, your apple trees all rolled in. You can spray that on there to control them. The leaf isn't going to unroll, but you're going to get the bug in there. Leaf hoppers, a lot of leaf hoppers carry viruses that are pretty detrimental to plants. And tomatoes are one of those plants that leaf hoppers like to go after. It'll suppress mites, coddling moth. Coddling moth is responsible for wormy apples. Thrips, plum procural, stink bugs. And to a little bit of extent, it'll control stink bugs, apple maggots. And, and again, it helps, it helps um, prevent sunburn on some of your fruit. Peppers are real prone to sunburn. And 
Yeah, they've done quite a bit of, of research on it. There's a company, a mail order company called um, Gardens Live, Gardens Live, and you can buy Surround, which is the trade name for it. Um, you can buy Surround from Gardens Live. Okay, so neem oil as a back from indica. So within there, there's more than 25 other active compounds have been have been isolated. So, so neem oil is a great insecticide, but it's non-selective. So it'll take out your good bugs. It'll take out your bumblebees, your honeybees, your native bees. We'll take out all the good guys too. So you have to know what insect you're spraying and why. So you don't ever use this as a preventive or I'm going to spray this so that you know the aphid that crawls on it doesn't get it. It's got to be a contact insecticide or it's got to be ingested. So there's got to be, um, you've got to be watching and you've got to say, oh yeah, I've got an insect problem. And so you might use it on spider mites or white flies, but it's a one shot deal because all those insects, the resistance is just huge. The nice thing with the neem oil is that because it has multiple modes of action, a lot of insects don't become resistant to it. And I passed the book around. Interesting book because I use it for a whole bunch of different things. You can go to the health food store and find neem oil and toothpaste and skin preparations. And so, so it's used a, a lot of different things just for naturopathic uses. So the LD50 is really, really high, 15,000. Active ingredient biodegrades rapidly in sunlight and within a few weeks within the soil. So it doesn't stay around, it doesn't stay around, which is, which is what you want. You don't want it to stay around. So spinosad. I, I do use this in my garden. Sacropolyspora spinosa. And um, the soil dwelling bacterium, the spinosad, excuse me. Um, again, you can you can only use it like twice before because insects can develop resistance to this pretty quickly. So what I'll do is with my cabbage or my cauliflower or broccoli, because I really don't want extra protein, um, I'll put the floating roll cover over it and then I'll spray it with the spinosad. And so the butterflies land on it and it kills them. So it has a unique mode of action coupled with a high degree of activity on targeted pests and a low toxicity to non-target organisms. So those non-target ones are going to be your, for the most part, your good bugs and mammals. In case you want to know how it kills them, again, it's a neurotoxin. It, it literally <clears throat> causes massive trem tremors, cessation of feeding, and paralysis within minutes. So this is fast. This is a fast knockdown on the insects. So if you're worried about whether you're being humane or not when you're killing a bug, this is pretty humane. Yeah, I know. Just step on it, right? <laughs> it's humane. Um, and then no other class of products affects the insect's nervous system with the same mode of action as this one does. So if you've got other insects that are resistant, then reach for the spinosad. Diaxmaceous herb, we talked about this. Fossilized silica shell remains of diatoms. And again, you want to be really careful using this. And you can go down to ST Organics in Hereford, Colorado, which is just across the border from Carpenter, and they'll sell it to you in a 50 pound bag because they sell it to the farmers and for their organic crop production because this is OMRI approved. But you don't want to breathe it. I want to be real careful by not breathing. Oh, 
garlic. So you can buy garlic in, in concentration in bottles. You can get it just about any place. Um, you should be able to buy it down in Colorado pretty easily. I don't know if I've seen it in the big box stores here. To be used for natural controls are present. Um, it's non-selective, so it does kill the beneficial insects too. So again, you've got to be careful with it. If you want to make your own garlic oil solution, you want to get a bulb of garlic and the smellier and stronger, the better. You're going to get a quart of water. You're going to throw it in your blender. You're going to whirl it around for about five minutes. Then you're going to uh, run it through a sieve, dilute it to a whole mm. gallon, and then you can spray it directly on the insects. Or you can use it as a soil drench if you've got like um, lilacs. Um, get black vine weevil. And so the black vine weevil lays its, its eggs and has the larva down in the soil. And so the larva crawl up or the, the weevil crawls up and then eats notches out of leaves. So it's kind of a cosmetic thing, but it also eats the roots of the lilac trees. And so you can make this and use it as a soil bench. So it helps to control the pill and suppress mosquitoes. I don't know about using it as a spray on yourself with mosquito repellent. Um, aphids, caterpillars, white flies, mites, some beetles. Yep, and the smellier the garlic, the better. So the stronger the better. So it's not going to be what comes out of the grocery store because that's not very strong. You're going to want to have um, like a hard neck garlic. Boron. Boric acid, borax, honey mule team, uh, works as a stomach poison. Slower works. So you have to have patience. A lot of these organic ones, you do have to have patience with them. And the LD is 3,200, so it's pretty non toxic, but you, know, you don't want to be tasting it. This, this soap. I've used it for ant control. And then I get little insects sometimes in the house they are called springtails. And people call and say, oh, I've got fleas in the house. And it's like, no, no, springtails. And it's in a totally different order of insects. But they, they spring up, they hop up into the air, kind of like a flea would. And so people automatically think they've got fleas. They don't. There's, there really isn't any fleas in Wyoming. It's too dry, too cold. Please want more moisture, more humidity. So, but we do get springtails. And if they bother you, just put some borax, um, 20 mil team borax down. That's an easy way to control. And the springtails are just there to, to eat debris. They're, they're just cleanup guys, they're a cleanup crew. They're kind of like little janitors. And yeah, the, the insect picks it up on their legs and then as they groom, groom themselves, they eat and ingest it. You can make it as a solution or you can just pour it, you know, just sprinkle it on the ground. Works on ants. Takes a while for ants, it takes a while. You might want to mix it with something else like some flour or some sugar or aspartame and use it that way. So pesticide soaps. Easy to make, again, just one or two tablespoons of liquid detergent to water and then spray it. Keep in mind that it can act as a herbicide. So you want to be a little careful on it. So it works by dissolving the membrane around the cells, resulting in dehydration and death. So, and it can also clog the spiracles and then they suffocate. Has to be direct contact. So you can't put it down and expect the insect to walk through it. You have to spray the bug directly. And so if you've got aphids on a rose, you can make your own insecticidal soap and spray it on. That'll work. And if it's above 85 degrees, you're gonna you're gonna hurt the plant. So that's why that's it. you're gonna hurt the plant. So the cool of the morning is always the best time for insect control. And the wind's not, with the wind's not blowing usually, usually. 
Soft bodied insects that work best on it doesn't work on most beetles. Beetles have got that hard exoskeleton, and so it's just going to kind of be repellent. Good for indoor use, outdoor. Yep, mix well. You can you can get pretty creative with this. You can throw garlic in there. You can throw lemon peels and orange peels in there, and and, and add more stuff to it. Traps. So the sticky traps, again, those go back to the, um, the sticky traps that Catherine brought in, the yellow sticky traps. Yeah, those work really, really well. And I use them out in the garden. I use them, you know, if I have, I don't have a, um, a fungus gnat problem, but, but if I did, that's the first thing I would reach for. Unless you've got, I, I just, it just dawned on me, if you have little kids, you want to touch stuff. They're not. <laughs> they're not going to get that sticky trap off without some adult supervision. <laughs> the cat doesn't get it off without supervision. <laughs> oh gosh, no, no. Yeah, I had that cat get a, a fly strip wrapped around him. That was <laughs> that was really fun. He was pretty upset too. So traps. Um, a lot of them, you can also get them with pheromones on them. And so people who have apple trees, you know, there's there's a lot of pheromone traps that you can put in your apple tree. And the, the, male, the male moth will fly to that trap and get stuck in there. So it's a sticky trap with a pheromone that attracts the males. And that way mating can't occur or limited or reduced mating occurs. So don't spray your apple trees. Just get the just get pheromone traps and put them in there. Little triangle things that you hang. I've had people make their own traps, and they'll take like a red. Um, gosh, what did that guy use? He had a red a red ball of some sort, and he put tangle foot on it, and he just hung it in his trees, his apple trees, and that's how he controlled his his um, pest problem. So he didn't use any sprays. You shouldn't have to use any sprays out there. Yeah. Uh, we actually have a uh, lemon tree outside the house, and we saw somebody um, use a carnivorous plant um, as a base of um, the lemon tree. And so uh, it's a Dicera yeah. plant, and then it, it sits in its own pot to receive more water than the lemon tree does, but it actually does help to control those gnats. Yeah. 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 vegetable oil, but you can buy horticulture oils as a petroleum-based product. Corn oil is cheaper. It's safer to use. You just put it on a sponge and just wipe it on. Sometimes the scale is way up in that tree and you do have to spray to get it. If an aspen tree has scale, I'm going to tell you to water it more. And so that's so if, if you're out there in the field and you're looking and someone's going, I don't know what's wrong with my tree, it's not behaving right, you know, it's got all these problems. The first thing you should say is water it more because <laughs> that's 90% of the tree's problems besides the wind. Oh, and canola oil is listed as a biopesticide. Yeah. And corn gluten meal is, is listed and 
corn flour is also listed. Corn oil is listed as a minimum risk pesticide. Oh, so we do have, well, for everyone who likes to grow small fruit like um, raspberries and, and strawberries, we have this little guy here, the spotted, spotted wing drosophila. And it, it's been a really tough one to control. And it's just about taking out the raspberry fields back east. The best way to control it is with bait or trap stations. And it likes the color red. It likes red. So get a red party cup and you just strain it up and you put a little bit of um, cellophane on top, but you make a hole in the top so it can get in there. And then you put some water and some food in there so it ferments, or you can put beer in there or old wine or whatever. And so it attracts the adults. And so the adults go in there and then they ground. And so that's a, it's a pretty easy, cheap way to do it. Um, they're using, they're working with this ethanol, the coal. And they're finding that works really, really well too for attracting. But again, it's, it's a sugar alcohol, it's just a fermented product. So you just use, just throw a piece of fruit in there. And you can also spray that on them. And so you can actually, um, but it has, again, it has to contact the insect. And they think it works by drying them out. So here's how this works. This fruit fly, so the raspberry is, is, is beautiful, it's red. It's like ready to pick. And you're really excited about it. And you walk out there and it's, it, the next thing it's just mush. It just looks like it's melted. Well, that's because the female lays her eggs on top of those little droops and, and they hatch into larvae that penetrate down into the fruit. And and that looks, that's what causes it to melt, but it doesn't happen right away. And the larvae are little tiny, tiny. Get a handheld lens out and look at them through a hand lens, and you'll see little tiny white streaks. And those are the larvae. So almost every raspberry plant in Wyoming has these, including yours in your backyard. And in mine too, I have found them in mine. I just go, well, okay, and I eat it anyway. <laughs> I, it's protein, right? I get a little protein in my <laughs> Sanitation is really important with the raspberry patch or the strawberry patch. And so the best way to clean up underneath those in the fall just get your shop back out and just shop back underneath there and, and shop and just vacuum up all the debris. That's the best way to keep the sanitation. That'll cut down the problem by at least 50%. Put your baits trapped out in the spring and catch the adults. And you'll, re you'll really reduce the population just tremendously by doing that, just those two things alone. And raspberries are very thirsty. They're not drought tolerant, so they need lots and lots of water. Usually the biggest problem I find with raspberries when people say, well, they don't produce, well, how much are you watering? And, and I usually get the, well, <laughs> okay, so beneficial insects. That's the normal ladybugs, green lace wings. These guys are beautiful. And again, a, grease, a green lacewing, her eggs, she'll lay it on just about anything that's handy, but it's a stalk with an egg up on the stalk. So if you see this sort of thing, those are grease, green lacewing eggs. Don't, don't kill them, don't harm them. And then your praying mantis egg cases, it really looks like someone sprayed some foam insulation. And and it's just a little, maybe about two inches long at the most. And, they'll, and she'll stick them to just about anything, wooden post, the side of your house, window, I mean, any place. And she's not picky. 
So very important, very cool insect. Perfect gamma wasp. So perfect gamma wasp are you can buy these a lot of these guys through insectaries. This is bipedic predators. So you can buy perfect gamma wasp, and there's a, there's hundreds of different species of them, but you can buy them and use them either in your pastures, if you've got horses or whatever, you can use them for that. And, but the insect, the, the perfect gamma needs a food source. Most wasps are parasitoids. So a wasp is looking for another insect to either lay its egg on, typically, and, and that's what these little trick gamma wasps do. They lay their eggs on another insect, a larva, and the larva, or they lay their eggs on the insect and the larva hatches and, and usually burrows into the insect. So if you've ever seen the movie Alien, <laughs> that's where they got the ideas from these wasps laying their eggs on top of the host and then burrowing in. And sometimes it kills the host right off or they keep the host alive long enough for the larva to morph into the adults. So, yeah, I mean, and this is why I say there, there's good insects and that will go after the bad insects. And so if you, if you make a habitat for your good insects, you really should never have to use an insecticide. And then if you don't over fertilize your plants, you're just not going to run into a big problem. This little guy, this is a true fly. This is the bee fly. This is Bombylius major. And my favorite insect, little fuzzy flying fly with huge eyes and a long proboscis. And people look at that long proboscis and go, oh, it's a stinger. Well, it's on your face. How can it be a stinger? <laughs> so, Totally harmless fly for humans and mammals, but she looks for aphids and she'll lay her eggs where there's a lot of aphids. And so they, the, ape, the larva hat, the larva will go after the aphids, the eggs hatch the larva, the larva go after the eggs. And she's just a nectar sipper. But just the coolest little bug, if you've got um, Rocky Mountain bee balm, which is a native or colony, um, you'll find you'll find this insect. But just when you find her in your garden, that's very special. It means you're doing something right. Kevin, you have to um you're concerned about like the regions of the country for, for the benefit of the insects. Well when they when they do the research on that they they make sure that it's a one size fits all and that it's not going to become an overpopulation problem. So they're very careful about that. The insectaries are super careful. So there's an insectary in Montana that raises um, weevils to go after toad flax and to go after napweed and to go after um, thistle, Russian um, yeah thistle, scotch thistle. So yeah, you can buy you can buy good bugs to go after your your um, weeds. So yeah. So one in Colorado can't send anything out of Colorado. Really, is that goodbug.com? Uh, oh really? Oh the state inspector? Okay. Yeah, the commercial insectaries are a little bit different, but there's an insectary in Montana that ships, and you've got to you've got to like order now for next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so M and R Durango is a commercial insectary. That's not the one in Dallas area. Yeah, she's. I've had her up to speak at a conference. She's pretty cool. That looks like from the bug, the fly, the tree bug, the bug fly. Mm -hmm. So in June, we really don't have this many flies. But from here, bees, the general animal forces, and how they, they 
So just a little bit on herbicides. There, there is not a lot of research done on them. And so there's not, a, there's not a lot of information out there on them. We do know that they're amino acid <clears throat> synthesis inhibitors, cell main disruptors, 
So they kind of burn those cells, uh, especially the membrane, the cuticle. Growth regulators, lipid synthesis inhibitors, photosynthetic inhibitors, seed growth inhibitors, and then the unclassified area. So Roundup blocks critical respiration enzyme pathway in plants. It's, again, it's the, it's the inert ingredient in glyphosate. The Roundup is really the big problem. So they can act as a post-emergent contact herbicide activated by sunlight to form active compounds. So when you use Roundup, it's got to be a sunny day out, it should be in the morning, active growth for Roundup to even work. So I have people tell me, yeah, I used it in November, December. It's not, it doesn't work that way. Um, 2,4-D. This is one that's used a lot in lawns to um, suppress dandelions, right? primarily in, in lawn care for dandelion suppression. The problem with it is that on a hot day, if it's used inappropriate at the wrong time, so inappropriately, I guess, then at least a bag of fertilizer is going to be really, really expensive this year. Yeah, I'm watching it or not, but it's, it's going to be one of those things where homeowners are going to go, oh, wow, the lawn can go without this year. But when they put 2,4-D in, in the fertilizer as a B, if it's hot outside or it's applied and then it gets hot out, it, the 2,4-D volatizes, it turns into a vapor and it will drip. And that vapor, that drifting vapor will take out your tomato plants and it will definitely take out grapes. I've seen 2,4-D damage on linden trees. Linden trees are really, really susceptible to that. And so uh, I'll walk around on campus and I'll get a hold of the grounds manager and I'll say, hey, by the way, <laughs> you have a problem. So it will, it will volatize, turn into a vapor, and drift and cause other plant damage. So you've got to use this with a lot of caution. If you're going to use it, it should be used early in the spring and in the cool of the morning and know that it's going to be cool for a couple of days. And corn gluten meal. So this is a cool product. This is the all natural wheat and feed. It's about 10% nitrogen. It's, it's not a one size fits all and it takes patience, but it works really well against your annuals, your especially your winter annuals, weeds that like to germinate in the cool of the year, cool soil temperatures, cool moisture. And so it's once it germinates, once the seed germinates, that's when this takes effect and works. It doesn't work in all parts of the country, and it's kind of one of those where you have to be persistent and use it for several years before you get to a good result. Uh, vinegar. You can use 5% vinegar, and so all those weeds that are in the in the concrete cracks, don't, don't waste your money with Roundup or Weepy Gone. Just take your regular white household vinegar, go out there at 2 in the afternoon when it's hot, and just sprinkle it on your weeds, and they will just I mean, they just burn right off. So very, very effective. 5% vinegar will take down thistle. It doesn't kill it, but it'll knock it back. And so that's kind of a trick with thistles to keep persistence. The vinegar will take out anything it touches, non-selective. Yeah, 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 very effective. You can. You can, you can get horticulture grade vinegar, which is 20%, but wear eye protection. Oh my gosh, wear eye protection and wear gloves because this stuff is really, really strong. And it'll, just the vapors will make your eyes burn. And of course, the best control ever for grasshoppers. Lousy flyers, lousy flyers, <laughs> but, but good at grasshopper control. So, 
you mention going to parties where you accept fertilizer, you're going to be really much successful this year? Because I missed that on my early break. No, no. Oh, sure. Most of the fertilizer is a byproduct of the petroleum industry. Um, and, and it's a byproduct of natural gas. And so, yeah. I mean, alfalfa pellets are still going to be usable, though, right? If you're making the total I I don't think you're going to find a problem with alfalfa pellets. We're still growing it. You know, we're not going to probably not have a product like we used to. But. Yes, Tom. Asking your opinion, do you have any concerns eating GMO grains? Nope. <laughs> 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 Okay, so I've had the uh, grass numbers too bad for the mm -hmm. Use your book, use your notes, um, call your neighbors, <laughs> class neighbors, classroom neighbors, and uh, I've got it on the I've got it on the schedule when we come back. So there'll be the, the landscape class, and then I think we come back. I don't have it. If anyone's got the schedule for me. When we have landscape design. Huh? Yeah, and so on March 16th, we'll go over the test and eat cake. <laughs> <laughs> so I can give you that long to take the test. Are we not having class on the 9th? On this day? Well, that one gonna, says test, and then the following one says yeah, we go over March seven. Yep. So we're going to skip the ninth. Go class on the ninth. Yep. So that gives you a lot of time to take the test. And the feedback I've gotten in the past about it is that I learned more by taking the test home and doing it. Mm -hmm. We have to do the research. So some of it will go back to the book. Some of it will be in your notes. And, and then if you really can't figure it out, call me. And I'll help you through it. So so I want you to I want you to take the test. I want you to pass the test. Yeah. One more um thought about tonight's topic. The integrated pest management. We tried something different. Decoys or habitats. Uh, yep, yep. Yep. It's pretty interesting. The little white mm -hmm. um, red wrapper closures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We used those you know, and put a couple dots on them and hung them above the cabbage plants <laughs> with fishing line. Yeah. It works. Really? Dots on those, they can flutter around, and those moths are territorial. Okay. So if something gets there first, no. moths don't. Moths, they get some other moths. Yeah. Because yeah. they are, they're a conundrum. Yeah. Uh, they're so reduce the number. Yeah. They didn't 
long outside, they're predators. Yeah, exactly. Um, sometimes they're the entertainment for the user. <laughs> yeah. And I have a kid in a mega horn one. Mega horn ones are the larva, the caterpillar of these things being small. Yep. Which it doesn't look like they're very small. Chickens are the ones that. We have dandelions in our backyard, and I'm going to do the leaves this time if I could. Yeah, I just and found a recipe in a book that, that calls for dandelions, but they put them in a batter mm -hmm. and then fry them, oh, fry yeah. dandelion heads. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're doing. I'm going to take it for Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Wildscaping 101. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. That's very good. Yeah. 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 Is it recorded? Uh, yeah. yeah. That was a national audubon. What is that talking about? Rock. Oh, Audubon Rocky. Yeah. 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 And they, they've got a class for gardening for hummingbirds. Mm -hmm. And so I got signed up for it. And it's uh, sold out. I'll send an email to everybody and I'll mm -hmm. host it. I'll try to host it in this room. And it's from noon to one or something. So it's over the lunch hour. So if you want to come watch it, I'll have it here. Oh, yeah. it's so good, good, right? Like, like that. Yeah. So it would be. Wow. So, Nasty. Laura, you were talking about the wasp crap. Right. What do you use? Uh, I just bought something at the, uh, I think it was Lowe's or Home Depot or something. It was just some kind of, it was an actual sure. wasp, yeah, some type of wasp trap. Was it a trap? Yeah. And yeah. There's another one that's um, green and hexagonal shape that attracts wasps too. And for point five, I think that's the one I got. Yeah. The yeah. green. Yeah. So and that's sticky one. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. That works. Yeah. Oh, it's a really pretty glass wasp. And I don't want to trap anything that I shouldn't be inside of there. If I and it's kind of like well, I'm not going to like catch it. So I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you if you put sugar water in there, so you want to yeah. try to find something that. <laughs> yeah, I want to put sugar water. Just to make negative look at it. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. They have a, there's one that has a pheromone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that would be the way to go. But with beehives, they actually because of the um, the lesion that's on it, they actually have developed another type of hive entrance. So you train your honeybees to come to a different entrance, and the wasp actually go through a slow entrance with the traps underneath the beehive. Mm -hmm. But that but they've developed that over in Europe to deal with that Asian. We look for that, we're watching it, but it hasn't left the Washington State yet. It's a great big Yeah, and I've, I, I've had people call me and go, I think this is it. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a software or something. There's some mimics out there. Yeah. Yeah. I had someone bring me a tarantula hawk moth. Tarantula hawk wasp. They're huge. They're huge. And and you don't ever want to get stung by them. They don't, they're not they're pretty tame. They're pretty tame, but you don't want to have a lot of Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, we have one of those like hitchhiker. They're huge. They're huge. We have spider hunting wasps here. And and they're they're beautiful. They're metallic blue. They're a, a dark, almost black metallic blue. And they'll go hunt spiders. And they'll lay their eggs on top of the spider. And so of course the, the eggs hatch into larva and then eat the eat the spider from the inside out. So I watched a this was the coolest thing. Of course, you know, you never had your camera when you need it. But I watched a wasp come into the garden and land and parrot and uh, Paralyze a grasshopper oh. and take it up 
You know, it was like only a, a third inch star. Pick it up and fly off with it. Wow. I, that was the coolest thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate nature. Um, but yeah, there's so there's a balance out there, and that's why if you've got a, a good diversity of flowers and wildflowers, and you're not spraying chemicals, you'll have good bugs that will take care of the bad bugs and keep the bad bugs in check. Catherine, if you could buy only one of those books about pesticides, organic pesticides, pest management for somebody in Kentucky, what would you, what would you buy? That common sense. The common sense. I, I wrote that one down. Yep, it looks really good. That's the other one. Yeah. Father in law. I'll get points. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when, I, when we were growing up in Pennsylvania, uh, our parents grew up during the Depression, and by the end of the winter, they were kind of anemic. And mm -hmm. Vandalized the thing, of course, and they would go out and collect a yeah. mask that wasn't actually vandalized mm -hmm. and wash them. Just keep the whole herd that together, wash them. <clears> and then there's a, a hot sauce that they went. Offered once a year. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I've had some friends asking me, I'm like, I don't. Every year. I've walked in here. Mom didn't appreciate the 